to the announcement session on Saturday at the Battle of Ideas. My name is Tiffany Jenkins, I'm the chair of this session, and I'm the Arts and Society Director of the Institute of Ideas. What we're going to be talking about, performing politics, is all the world at a stage, is the relationship between art and politics, in particular between theatre, opera, and politics. This is a session that's sponsored and supported by the ENO, so I expect there'll be a little bit about opera in it. Um, you'll be used to the format by now. Quick fire, five to seven minutes from my panellists. Conversation between us and then over to you to see who's awake. And I've seen lots of very large cups of coffee, so I expect <laughs> a lot from you. Speaking first, on my far left, we'll hear from Christopher Cook. He's a visiting professor at the University of the Arts London and the convener of the pre-performance season with the ENO during the conversation. These are really brilliant talks that are done before the operas at the ENO and they're not, sometimes they're just fairly abstract and broad, sometimes they're directly relevant to performance. After Christopher, we'll hear from Patrick Marmion, who's a writer and critic and convener of the Soapbox Debating Forum. <laughs> we'll then hear from Tom Morris on my far right, He's the awarding winning, award winning artistic director of the Bristol Old Vic, director of the, King, the Death of King Hoffer, as well part of the ENO new season. And then scribbling furiously on my immediate right is Joyce McMillan. Um, Joyce is the chair of the Hansa Society Working Group in Scotland, judge 2010 of the Saltire Scottish Book of the Year Award, and she's a theatre, theatre, theatre critic for Scotsman. And I should say, if you ever do anything in Edinburgh, in August, she is the woman we have to impress. So, Chris, if I start with you, we'll see how we get on. Thank you, thank you very much. I thought I might begin by sharing just two utterly random moments that I remember uh, over the last, I suppose, 20 years of, of seeing theatre and opera. The first was at the performance of Serious Money, a Carol Churchill play that some of you may remember, uh, endeavoured um, to stick the knife between the first and second ribs of British capitalism. It had a huge success at the Royal Court and then transferred to the West End where it literally ran and ran and ran, uh, which is where I caught up with. And I sat next to a man, a well-suited, well-heeled man with his partner, who laughed uproariously throughout the whole of the evening. Um, and at the interval, by way of conversation, I said, what are you enjoying the place? He said, the rhyming cup, that's a really so clever. And I said, well, what do you do? Well, he said, actually, I, I, I work on the London Financial Future Exchange, which was, of course, the very subject the play was attacking. The other, the other memory is a more recent one. It's of the production of Parsifal in Bayreuth in 2008 um, by Stefan Herfer. Um, this was an extraordinary production of Parsifal in a whole history of extraordinary productions of Wagner's last opera that tried to weave together not only this bizarre myth but also the history of Germany since perhaps Bismarck and reunification but also with the story of Bayreuth and above all the Wagner's in Bayreuth. So much of the set looked a little like Wahnfried, the house that Wagner built for himself and his second wife Cosima and Wagner's grave was on stage throughout of it. Um, it made a suit of an iconoclastic response to both German history. And, so, and then suddenly, in the middle of the second act, the largest swastika I've ever seen fell from the flies. Now, you'll probably know that it's illegal in Germany to fly the swastika. The screams of fury from the audience were almost unendurable. The performance continued, and, and nobody seemed to remember anything about it. The opera continued and finished. And what conclusions do I draw from those two rather uh, abstract memories? Well, the first one is that I think that those whom the theatre would chastise, particularly politically, enjoy nothing more than a really good public meeting. <laughs> and we should know that too, because we remember Brecht and Viles' complete disappointment after the opening of the Diagnosian Opera in Berlin, uh, that somehow the very people they wished to discountenance were queuing. And within weeks, you could buy rolls of threatening opera wallpaper from the large department store in Berlin. Um, the other conclusion, I suppose, is that, frankly, beating audiences about the head is rather like hitting your own head on a wall politically. It's very nice, um, but when you stop, and uh, it's probably better that you prefer not to remember anything about the experience. What I think makes for dull, disappointing, and I would also argue ineffective political theatre is quite simply shot for its own sake. That kind of free song in which you learn the swastika uh, uh, on the stage uh, may indeed cause intake of breath, but does it really uh, 
process of argument about how this particular opera written in 1876 uh, becomes central to what actually happens within German politics in the dark corridor that runs from 1933 to 1945. I also think that preaching, frankly, uh, isn't particularly useful. I mean, I think it's interesting that Brecht himself, who for many of us remains a model at least one model of political theatre, learnt so soon, particularly when he went back to Berlin and founded the Berlin Ensemble, that in a way the plays that simply were there um, were basically preaching to the converted, that there were other sorts of theatre. I'm always struck by the, the revisions to Galileo that include that astonishing scene in which Cardinal Barberini, who you remember has been the friend of Galileo through the early part of the play, has now been elected Supreme Pontiff um, and is about, of course, to uh, uh, allow the ex potential excommunication and the torturing of Galileo. And the scene in which this happens has Barberini being, as it were, enrobed to take up the papal chair. A piece of kind of total, almost ham Victorian costume drama in the middle of the record play. I also think that the political theatre that confuses facts with strongly held opinions, by and large, is less effective. I'm endlessly pleased by, for example, the kind of work that gets done at the tricycle, it's also been done at the national, that takes documents, transforms reports, and tries to find ways of telling the stories of the events within those reports and documents as truthfully as possible to an audience who neither have the inclination or possibly the necessary skills of reading between the lines of what a society tells its official self about itself. Um, I think also that the single-minded single kind of neo brechtian approach to political theatre that one finds in some corners uh, of, of certainly British theatre, but certainly European theatre occasionally these days, is also not particularly constructive. It seems to me that what it forgets is one fundamental fact about the theatre, and it doesn't matter whether it's the spoken theatre, whether it's the music theatre, that in the end it's always the same, it's about telling stories. And that it forgets about telling stories, it perhaps forgets that one of the reasons that we're moved, one of the reasons that we're persuaded to think uh, about uh, wider issues than whether uh, the baby's nappies have been changed and whether the set looked real and we wouldn't mind living in the house, is indeed the characters who interact with each other. Bernard Shaw uh, understood this entirely. If you follow the journey of Shaw's writing from uh, plays, uh, unpleasant to the end of his career, you follow a man who learns pretty soon not so much to sugar the pill of political dialectic, uh, widows, houses, Mrs. Warren's profession, but someone who understands in the end that you have to put real people in real situations on stage. So, in a sense, I suppose the personal uh, on the stage is always the political to turn that little construction around the other way. And put simply, if the world is a stage, then the politics have to grow out of organically and out of the complete world that you actually create on the stage. I choose to end with two other examples, having begun with examples. David Puntley's recent production of Weinberg's opera, The Passenger, at English National Opera, which seemed to me to be an extraordinary piece of political theatre in ways that often the audience was surprised by. This was, for example, the politics of the Holocaust, told not from the perspective that so many of us have grown up, but told from the Soviet perspective. Thus, the key political gesture in the production became the singing of that folk song by the Russian girl who was in Auschwitz. Uh, and this became to me as effectively politically as anything else I've seen in the Opera House recently. And the other piece I would choose would be Sean Holmes's current revival of Saved at the Lyric Theatre Hammersmith, a reminder of how Bond, perhaps the most intense, along with one or two of his own generation of political writers, manages always to make political theatre out of the, uh, the characters that he finds in stages. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I, I made the, um, I've got a bit of a slightly loud voice, uh, so I don't know if I'm deafening you, you wave uh, <laughs> at the back. I don't know, maybe I should abandon the, the microphone, but uh, at least I have it indirect. You know, I, I made the mistake of, um, uh, of writing a speech, but I made the second mistake of writing a speech illegibly. So, uh, uh, I, I should also uh, warn you, or at least uh, a plea for some sort of uh, latitude here, that I, I kind of try to come at this from a philosophical point of view. I'm not a philosopher, so if there are any um, 
philosophers uh, out, out here amongst us, please exercise some forbearance, uh, if not pity. Um, the question uh, is, um, all, all, is all the world a stage? And uh, I think uh, the answer has got to, to that, to my mind at least, has got to be apparently yes, absolutely, it is. Um, and I think it's very good um, to think of it so, uh, not just figuratively, but also but actually literally. And I think I say this because I think it's um, uh, creatively and politically thinking of it so, thinking of it in that way reveals the world as I think it is, and that is man. You know, it is possible to change. It. Um, uh, first of all, I think though it's, it's, it's important to uh, acknowledge that uh, uh, this uh, may not be what Shakespeare had in mind when he said, uh, uh, you know, with his speech, uh, he, he, well, he, he may well have meant something more fixed by his speech, although they have their exits and their entrances and so on. He's talking about the progression of every um, human being as being a kind of universal constant. So you could see it in that, in that way, but maybe uh, I'm wrong to interpret this uh, uh, as being a, such a, a malleable uh, uh, suggestion that maybe it is more mechanical. Um, but we can also see that Shakespeare's plays do a lot more, do a lot to undermine the spectacle. Uh, his most famous uh, 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 for his puns, of course, you know, the uh, such line in Hamlet, the oodles of them. One that always springs to mind, I never um, think of a Shakespearean pun, is the one in Hamlet. They do but jest, poison and jest, which is uh, what Hamlet says of the play. So the idea of uh, joking and ingesting poison. Um, and uh, uh, there is the, uh, also, the, there's the lack of scenery in his plays, of course, because the landscape of his plays really was uh, was a verbal landscape, and it kind of painted pictures in uh, uh, in the mind. So you're talking about the, Henry, the beginning of Henry V. And he talks about I think it's the vasty fields of France. Um, I think is it vasty fields or am I anyway? I'll be correct if I don't. The um, and I think that the, the the third aspect of it is Shakespeare's almost constant use of metaphor. Um, which uh, I, I think grasps the world as an essentially elusive and, 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 and mutable place. And these, are, these things have been come to, to uh, be understood, I think, uh, as, as what defines Shakespeare as a kind of radical writer. It is, it is what makes Shakespeare Brechtian, if you like. It is his built-in alienation device. Um, and it reveals how the world is a changeable place. But there is a problem, uh, to my mind, with this, and this is when I'm going to, I'm going to wade into the hot water of uh, some kind of philosophy. Um, but, um, uh, and that is that uh, we are all ready, I would uh, propose, already embedded in the spectacle. If you think of the spotted on stage as a spectacle, it seems to me that in many ways we're already uh, in, embedded in it. That if you like, these, the play that we're witnessing is a play within the play that we're already participating in. Uh, in other words, um, uh, what I'm saying, what if we are actually already partly shaped by the spectacle, uh, the spectacle in the broadest sense, I suppose we might, if you see the matrix, you know what I mean, the, uh, uh, the sense that we are already, that we are involved in a kind of charade, which is also not just that we shape, but also which shapes us. Uh, and, and what if our belief that we can change the spectacle and into acting it is indeed part of the spectacle itself? Part of the way that that spectacle, if you like, reproduces itself. Um, the challenge, it seems to me, would then be to figure out how to escape this hall of mirrors. Um, now, what I'm not proposing by uh, saying this is that uh, uh, that we can um, uh, we can somehow escape the illusion of this spectacle in some sort of Buddhist uh, term. We can actually pass from uh, illusion to, uh, to to enlightenment, and that false consciousness can be like traded in for enlightenment and so on. Uh, uh, and what I am uh, saying is that, that what lies beyond the spectacle is essentially unknown, uncharted and impossible. It is, in, it is in a strict sense maybe you might say it doesn't exist. In philosophical terms I think what you might say a spectacle in is what you know is the stage spectacle that we all participate in is our, uh, our ontology. It is um, all that we know. Uh, and my gambit is that we should um, we should have faith in what lies beyond 
uh, nonetheless, we should have faith in what lies beyond uh, our own apparent ontology. Uh, as William Blake put it, if, if the doors of perception, that you probably know this is a bit of a teenager, a teenage favourite, you know, the, if the doors of perception were cleansed, uh, the world would appear to us as it is, infinite. And uh, of course, Jim Morrison uh, took that perhaps too literally. But uh, I, um, uh, what I'm saying is that this, this idea of the infinite, though, is not any kind of picnic. What I'm saying that this, what it lies beyond, it is is the void. It is kind of, it is as, as I've said, unknown. And I think the great challenge uh, for us as human beings, and perhaps even as, uh, as, as for creative artists themselves, um, is to um, is, is to go uh, beyond uh, the spectacle. And, and um, this is where I have difficulty reading my own writing, of course, as as, as was foretold. That uh, the um, uh, this, this go beyond the spectacle, which is intended, if you like, to insulate us from the uh, uh, from what lies beyond. Um, this means two things, to, uh, I think, to some of us, as far as uh, you know, for me. One is that I think a properly political theatre needs to go beyond the coordinates of what is normally um, designated as political. Uh, and the risk, though, is that uh, is of being incomprehensible and of being rejected. Uh, there is, uh, and in this uh, scenario, there's really no space for careerism. You know, you're not going to, you're not going to uh, be able to draw down a pension, I think, uh, by following this kind of course. And of course, you also run the risk of being dismissed as a crank or an avant-gardist. Um, although, of course, there is great career, career possibilities in avant-gardism. A crank, shall we say, just below. The, other, the second thing is, apart from uh, uh, the, the coordinates of what is regarded as political, and this is my final point, is that, the, um, that we need to politicise uh, um, uh, we need to politicise our own response to theatre and indeed to culture generally. And we need to see the political, if you like, everywhere and treat all culture, not just theatre, as a political spectacle, symptomatic, if you like, of our way of life. Um, and it's a symptom, I would say, that it's analysis, and that we need to be especially um, uh, circumspect about what seems uh, to us uh, to be uh, to be natural, normal, sensible. Uh, because this, it seems to me, is, is what is uh, is part of the problem, not the solution. And uh, what we regard as natural is the ideal, is the ideological spectacle, in its essence. Tom. Um. I made the mistake of not writing a speech. Um, I, um, I had an argument the other day with a man from an organisation called Forum for the Future, an organisation which uh, I find quite inspiring. I don't know if people know about it, it's an environmental organisation. Um, and he was, uh, he was putting together some sort of uh, conference week uh, in Bristol. Um, and he said, um, can you put on some uh, plays during this week? which will help make the arguments uh, in favour of uh, reform in our environmental uh, behaviour. And I said, um, probably not. And, and then he said, no, but, but, but I've read about this. There are all sorts of funds you can apply for, which are specifically to resource art projects, which are about raising consciousness about environmental danger and change. Um, surely you sign that money and put on a great work of art. Um, and I was uh, forced to say, well, much as I uh, agree with your politics, um, I don't agree with your arts policy. Um, I would be absolutely delighted if a great artist made a great work of art um, in that or in any other area. Um, but I think that if you really want to make your point politically, you'd be better off doing it through a conference like this or an advertising campaign, but not by creating a work of art. Um, however, I have been wrestling with the question of what political performance might be um, with a kind of uh, keen sense of my own vulnerability uh, since I agreed to direct an opera at the ENO um, after Christmas, which is called The Death of Klinghoffer, um, which is an opera about um, the hijacking of the Achille Lauro uh, cruise ship um, in 1985 by members of the PLF um, and when it was first performed um, it caused a major political storm um, the, uh, the children of the man who was shot 
during the uh, hijacking, a man called Klinghoffer, um, uh, were very, very offended uh, by the opera, um, and particularly in North America, where it's dared to say, dared to um, uh, put into the mouth of one of the hijack hijackers the phrase, we are men of ideals, um, it was thought to be simply politically uh, uncountenanceable. Um, and as a, as a director approaching the, uh, the task of trying to, to, to put this opera on stage, you feel a bit like a gnat about to fly into a furnace because there appears to be uh, nothing but bad stuff that can happen once you start to try and work out what you want to do with a uh, piece of work. So I've been thinking about this a lot and, and also thinking about different ways in which art uh, can be and is political. Uh, picking up on what Chris was saying about um, what a, a weak instrument even Brecht ended up thinking uh, theatre was if you want to make a direct change happen. Are there other ways in which the political impact of art can be useful? And I, I have two examples. Uh, the second is Klinghoff, which I'll come to in a minute. And of course, I don't know what the impact of our production will be. Um, the first is uh, a, a production which was made by some graduates of the youth theatre at Bristol Old Vic, where I work. Um, and what happened was we have a very strong youth theatre, uh, kids from all over the city. Um, and a group of them had been in the, the Young People's Theatre, as they call it, for uh, a number of years. Some of them had been to drama school and come back. Others were just leaving school and preparing to go away and study. They wanted to make a company together, so we helped them make a company. And they decided to make a show. Um, and they made a show about an incident you may remember, um, which was at um, a furniture store in South East London, South East London um, where there was a riot. Uh, uh, do you remember that story? There was a huge riot. It was going to be opened at midnight. They had to open it at midnight with a huge discount, and all this sort of uh, Volvo driving uh, customers of the, uh, the furniture store um, uh, essentially were, were jamming the doors and trying to get in. Um, and they rioted, uh, fighting each other, uh, and in one incident, stabbing each other uh, because they were unable to get the furniture at the kind of discount that they had hoped to get. Um, and at the time, this was a course celebra, and with the guys in the, in the, young, the young company decided they wanted to make a show about this, and they did, and it was pretty good, actually. Um, and then they put it on in Bristol, and then they decided to take it to Edinburgh. And in between those two things happening, there were riots uh, in this city and many other major cities, including Bristol, across the country, in which we saw young people um, stealing TVs, training shoes, whatever, looting, essentially. Um, and so when our young company got to Edinburgh and put on their play, um, it was astonishingly relevant, powerfully political, uh, in a way that they could not possibly have anticipated when they set about making it. Um, and there is, I think, um, it's worth bearing in mind the impact of accidental resonance in a work of art, as well as the impact of uh, purposeful argument making. Um, to talk very briefly about Klinghoff, because I'm probably running out of time. Uh, at the beginning of, uh, I'm in the process of working this out, so I don't know what the show's going to be like, uh, and I don't know what the perception's going to be like, obviously. Uh, but at the start of this opera, there are two choruses, extraordinarily beautiful music by John Adams, um, and Weird Libretto by Alice Goodman. Um, the first one is a Palestinian chorus. In between, incidentally, there was a satirical scene in the original production uh, in which some friends of the Klinghoffer family bickered about them, and that was cut in Belgium, never mind New York, and is now not in the opera anymore. So you start with these two adjacent choruses. The Palestinian chorus um, tells a story of the clearance of a Palestinian village in 1948. Um, it's a very powerful narrative, it's, a, it's beautifully a kind of plangent music to start with and then it becomes violent. Um, uh, listen to it on iTunes if you don't know it, it's an amazing piece of music. Um, and then after that you have the Israeli chorus, or it's called the Chorus of Exiled Jews. And the, lyric, the, first, the first lyric of that is, um, when I paid off the taxi, I had no money left, but of course no luggage. 
And um, the, the libretto is very poetic in this, in this opera. And I was talking to the librettist, Alex Goodman, and I said, do you mind my asking, um, who's speaking at, at this point? Do you have in mind a particular exiled Jew who is saying, when I paid off the taxi, is there a particular uh, situation you're imagining? And she said, no, she wasn't imagining anything in, in particular. Um, and we talked a lot about, about the politics of uh, Israel and Palestine uh, in, a, in a general way, and then sometimes in a specific way. And it's certainly not my job to um, articulate her political views when I'm staging the opera. It's my job to listen to her as a poet, even when I can't understand her. Um, and after quite a lot of conversations, she, she asked me a question, and she said, um, uh, do you think the um, economic imbalance between Israel and Palestine um, is understood too lightly as part of the, that particular politics of conflict. It was only a question. Um, and in my mind, and I don't know what she would say about this, there was then suddenly a link with this line, when I paid off the taxi, I had no money left, and of course no luggage. I still don't know who she meant to suggest by that, but I have in my mind someone who is spending their last money, in spite of having no luggage, on a taxi. And there's a straight, I don't know where this goes politically, uh, but my approach in relation to staging this opera, which has itself a political history, um, in relation to a political conflict which has dominated the last half century um, and doesn't look back near resolution is to myself ask a tiny question, which is we have here two great, peculiar, perverse, and very articulate artists, John Adams and Alice Goodman, who have addressed this problem. I wonder whether, if we listen to them open mindedly in their work, we might possibly understand something in some tiny degree which enlightens us in relation to that political question. And it's in that sense that I'm inspired by the possibility that art might be political. Thank you, Jules. Yeah, I think um, I'm going to talk mainly about theatre because I am a theatre critic. Um, I think there is a kind of big paradox in theatre when it comes to theatre and radicalism, in that most people who work in theatre think of themselves as quite radical, quite left wing, quite dissenting. Um, and most of them like, uh, uh, from time to time in their career, to be involved in work which they see as having some relevance or something to say about um, the society that they're in, and hopefully something critical um, and something that might change things a little. And um, if you um, interview actors and directors and playwrights a lot um, and talk to them, as I have the, the privilege of doing, um, you soon learn how often the thing which first inspired them um, to become involved in theatre was not the kind of motives that people normally ascribe to lobbies as they're uh, derogatory known. It's usually some kind of slightly, at least slightly, radicalising experience um, which causes them to think, well, this could be a, a, an exciting life, a purposeful life, a life with some meaning, a life that maybe even breaks down some social barriers. You know, people will talk about working at, at, at the Victoria Theatre in Stoke and Trent, or they'll, they'll talk about working at the Citizens in Glasgow in the great days of the Citizens, or whatever. They'll talk about of working at Stratford East, you know, in the days of, um, in the days of Joe Littlewood. So you, you, that, that you've got a profession which, in a way, wishes to be radical and sees itself as radical and understands that it has somewhere in the background of its activity a radical potential um, which is kind of recorded in the history of theatre because it's always been an arena in which societies have um, um, been able um, at best to confront um, their big issues and yet at the same time everyone who works in theatre is conscious that it very rarely actually achieves anything radical if ever. Um, Christopher's already talked about, um, about um, the Brecht situation, you know, and Brecht, one of the greatest rethinkers of theatrical form probably ever, certainly of the 20th century, and still himself judged his own achievement very harshly when it came to actually changing society through making um, theatrical presentations. So we do need um, I, to try and understand what's going on there, and you know, to try and assess whether there are moments when theatre can have 
um, a radical impact and what kind of moments they are and what maybe are the wrong assumptions about what radical theatre is um, that sometimes lead um, artists and, and, and people who are funding artists, as Thomas said, um, up the wrong track. And so I began sort of searching through my mind, through my own back catalogue of theatrical experience to see if I thought I had ever seen anything really which had changed people in a way that might have affected um, their political future, their decisions, their sense of themselves as citizens, something like that. Um, and I found that the, the, the shows that came to mind were not necessarily all the ones that you would, you would first think of, and some of them were actually quite counterintuitive. The first one was certainly one that most people in Scotland would think of, which was a show called The Chibiot, The Stag and The Black Black Oil, which was a, a show created by 784 Scotland, the explicitly political theatre company, so-called because at that time 7% of the population owned 84% of the wealth, I think the statistic has actually deteriorated somewhat since. But um, 784 um, did this show called The Chibiot, The Stag and The Black Black Oil, back in the early 1970s, and they did it explicitly and politically as a rallying call to the people of Scotland to think about land use and politics in Scotland, to think about the use of land for sheep, for oil, um, and for um, sporting estates rather than for the well-being of the people. But the things which have actually left the most profound legacy about the Chibi at the side of the Black Black Oil, although the content is still good and relates to some of the kind of verbatim theatre um, that Chris talks about, but the content obviously would change with time, you know, the statistics would change and so on. The legacy it has left is to do with form. It's to do with actors standing up, changing characters fast, looking as if they're in command of a whole political agenda, um, being a band as well as a theatre company, talking to the audience as equals, and above all, not being depressed. And a lot of the drama in Britain, which claims to deal with political subjects, is in fact profoundly reactionary because it is so depressing. And um, the point about the genie at the side of the black, black oil um, is that it actually made people feel as if they could stand up and do something. And I re recently saw an anniversary reading of it where all the actors sat in a circle throughout the whole evening and it wasn't a radical experience at all. It was interesting, it was historic, but the point about it was that they, whatever they were doing, they weren't sitting down. They were utterly transforming themselves the sense of what a theatrical occasion could be, and they were making people feel that there were options. It was a kind of opening sort of process. Um, and later on, John McGrath, who was responsible for all that, went on to, 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 to write about this very interestingly and in great detail in a series of lectures that he gave at Cambridge University in um, the early 1980s. And um, that's still very well worth reading. But the second two experiences were ones which had profoundly to do with language, the first is John Byrne's Slab Boys trilogy, which opened at the Traverse Theatre in the late 1970s and kind of reinvented the idea of working class Scotland as a place not full of people kind of uh, sitting gazing into their sort of uh, break time tea mugs and, and describing how their fathers have been filmed in the nights and the shipyards, all that, which, you know, they're a perfectly valid strain of drama, but, you know, it was familiar by that time. Um, but it was um, a, a, a play which kind of um, reinvented Scottish working class language in a way that was so kind of brilliantly vivid and poetical and definitely postmodern, which was quite early to be so definitely postmodern, um, in a way that suggested that sort of Paisley and indeed the back streets of Paisley were the centre of the world. It was like a whole experience of the British polity and American popular culture and everything really, the whole state of the world at that time was filtered through this new sensibility. And it was only possible to do that by reinventing a language which could carry that. And then thirdly, Liz Lockett's very clear, the Scots going head chopped off, 1986, again, practically invented a new language in order to convey the idea that Scottish history was something different from what people stereotypically thought of it as being. And the, the changing effect that it had on people was through the absolute depths of the language, nothing to do with the outlines of the plot, which were quite interesting, and a lot to do with the actual weight and force of the poetry. And if you think about the legacy of Shakespeare, think about it, why is he important? It's because he was almost inventing the idea of a complete and kind of early modern English nation through the language that he was synthesizing, and at that time, of course, the language flexible enough for him to do that. 
So it seems to me that if you're going to get political change out of a theatrical situation, it's not because it talks about transformation. It's not because it talks about politics, although it may or may not do that. It's because it actually embodies the change. You know that kind of new agey slogan, be the change you want to see or whatever it is. You know? Well, theatre is profoundly about that. If it embodies the change um, to which it aspires, then it can change the, the, the sort of sense of self of the audience. If it only talks about it, if it only chats about it, and if it only, only, only um, reflects upon it, then nine times out of ten it's actually quite reactionary in its impact, even when it's quite progressive in its intention, because it ends up being quite dull and quite depressing. Thank you, Chris. Um, yes, that's right. maybe with you, Chris, and I'm very interested in responding to some of Joseph's points. I mean, some of the examples you were talking about in the 70s and 80s, we mm -hmm. were talking about much more political times. Yeah. Not to imagine the past, but certainly there was a greater sense of you join a political movement, you join the trade unions, you do something. There was a left and a right. There was a right to hate and a left to kind of be part of, or the other way around, depending on uh, your political social. And that's not here now. Um, and so, is it not just the case that we're watching other people do something that we can't do, and therefore it can't in any way? Well, I, mean, I think I think it's not only that the times were a different kind of political theory, um, but but in a sense, the way in which um, society privileged particular spaces in which these sort of debates could take place. In general. I mean, you only have to go to the theatre um, uh, uh, to see that, that with, without many exceptions, the theatre audience have grown much older than they were in the 1970s. I mean, you, you three will have much better ideas about this, but my sense, even, say, going to the National on the Travel X deal, that certainly going outside London is that's like... Under 26. That, so. That's right, and which you go there for 10 pounds or 50 pounds. Mm -hmm. but my sense is that the, the, the people, the theatre is no longer quite the central act uh, that, that perhaps it was in the 70s and 80s. It's not only the politics change. But, but the actual habit of what we expect in the theatre just. But I would like to pick up something that John said, because I think, I think she's absolutely right about language and about the transformative nature of great pieces of theatre. Um, in a sense, what, what you see in the end is, is the possibility of change within the invention of a complete world entirely described by the language. And Slab Boys um, um, uh, reminds me exactly what, 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 what is possible. There is something uh, you did check screen about that. So in a way, what, what the ambition needs to be is to be at a point in cultural time where the challenge of finding a language, uh, or whatever we mean by language, is simply birth, by the way, and it's gestural as well. Uh, can, can, can it be, be, be taken bold enough to want to uh, bring about that transformative moment? So uh, and that's about ambition, I think, mm -hmm. as much as about politics and, uh, and about subsidy and support. Um, you know, it's about it's about individual ambition. I mean, in a way, the three examples that Joyce tell were about three writers who had huge ambitions, um, and maybe 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 lost sight of their ambition. Sorry, I love your question. But the verbatim stuff that you mentioned then is just laziness, really. Is that right? You know, the way in which people have um, have used the trials. Of the Hutton trial, I think, and yeah, other things in their writing is just laziness. I think this can be very effective. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm on the end of a line here. But for example, I thought the David Sayers play stuff happens. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it, at certain moments, really managed to take an immensely complex subject by using the kind of official <laughs> by making no attempt to put lookalikes on stage. This wasn't Madame Tussauds. Um, this was actually a series of debates about people with genuinely held positions about what they thought they ought to be doing. Wherever you stood yourself, in the end, what became fascinating, as the very title of the play suggested, was that the way in which they expressed what they thought they were doing. Stuff happens, the celebrated phrase. In a sense, in, 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 in totally encapsulating the, the Pentagon view at, at the time about what Iran was about. I suppose my question with that would be, um, isn't it preaching to convert it? Aren't the people going to stuff happens, people who All who things agree. about preaching to the converted. Well, it's yeah. only preach to the converted. I mean, you know, when, when you go to church, the, the, uh, the, 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 when the, pre, the, the priest stands up to give his homily, you know, doesn't usher, usher in some unconverted. And uh, <laughs> put to hear his sermon. So, but it's a, it's, a, it's a serious point, I don't think, because 
the, the, the point about it is that the converted need need to be preached to in order to maintain their faith. You know? And actually also the preaching of course has a bad name. I mean bad preaching is 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 ghastly, you know, of course it is. But actually a preaching which is a kind which is a form of, of uh, bringing people together or sharing ideas and trying to and, and, and a kind of form of renewal is, is, is seems to be wholly worthwhile. And how do you avoid it being adequate? Because there's that tension. Well, it can be all right. I actually saw quite a good show. I mean, I'm a judge on the on a, um, the Freedom of Expression Award, which is a, a prize that Amnesty International gives every year on the Edinburgh Fringe to the play that is deemed to have made the biggest contribution um, to freedom of expression. And this year, we couldn't decide at all between a very good, very straight piece of agit pop about slavery in Britain that was brilliantly done. And the little the writing and the little cameo scenes about various people who were trafficked into Britain for various reasons were really, really strong. Um, and a very large, you know, wide-ranging poetic drama, a child by a writer called Zimmy Harris, which really tried to get to the bottom of the idea of war and the sort of cycles of violence and the abuse of children, particularly in yeah, not abuse exactly, but just the situation of children in in, in war in, you know, in, in, in faced by the phenomenon of war. And in the end, we just split it between them. I mean, one was like a huge poem. The other was really what you would call a piece of magic pop. But they were both very good. And I mean, one of the things about theatre is that you should never say never. It's not the case that magic pop is never do not. Sometimes it just is. You know, the GPA decided to like that like, one was magic pop. But it was very good. Yeah. I, I, it's a slight danger of looking through the telescope the wrong way, or at least not looking both ways, because um, if, for example, we're talking about stuff happens, which I also thought was great, um, and then uh, we ask the question, well, did that actually change anything? Did that change anything politically at all? No, uh, it was too late anyway. Um, therefore, it wasn't a useful piece of political theatre. Then we end up in a defeatist position. Uh, and I, I'm, I suppose I'm more interested in a very personal question to everyone here, which, is, which follows on from what Joyce was saying which is um, about how theatre, whether it calls itself political or not, or indeed art in general, might have changed us personally. What are the moments that we can reflect on and remember where we experience a shift of perception uh, in relationship with the work of art? And what might we do with that? Um, rather than just to assume that we're talking about um, us assuming that a work of art we agree with either can or can't change other people, not us. Can I say, I think you're absolutely right, and we can all think, I mean, from, from when we were very relatively this point, I mean, I can think of, 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 of listening for the first time um, to the Four Tops, and understanding um, from, from one of their tracks something fundamental about myself, if I had most of that. What was the track? Um, seven Rooms of Blue. What was the discovery? <laughs> that, that you could be gloomy and happy simultaneously. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very important feeling in the 60s. Because we really want to be gloomy, but in fact you also thought you were happy. But, but I, I, I think the trouble is that often these moments, if you like, of illumination, these moments of personal change that come from the encounter that we work on, are often couched in the form of, 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 of a sort of rather simple uh, personal humanism. Um, what, what interests me is how you extend yeah. that particular, as it were, discourse to embrace the notion of social change with you as an individual, not simply, you know, seeing, as Virginia Woolf said in that rather lame phrase, the match burning in a crocus, mm -hmm. but how in the end you see yourself as belonging to the other people at, at the moment where you have that kind of transfer. I think sometimes theatre can do that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think the, the ones I mentioned, uh, John Byrne and Liz Lockett, I think they did change, but not very large numbers of people, but I think in the kind of core groups of kind of big way interested people in Scotland who saw those, they did, they opened up, they opened up new ideas about what, what Scotland could be. They, they wiped away the idea that Scotland was a place of the past and, and made people see that Scotland could be a place that was actually kind of further into the future than it knew it was. And that, and that was the kind of effect of, of John Byrne in particular, I think, shifted people's sense of the, the time zone in which their nation was living. And that is incredibly empowering. If you stop thinking about yourselves as a place of the past and start thinking about yourselves as a place of the future, that has huge knock-on effects. And I think, I think, I can see that with hindsight now, you see, 25 years on. I couldn't tell you the plays I'm seeing now which are going to have that kind of effect. 
Uh, but, but looking back over the history of it, you can see that now. It wasn't that huge numbers of people saw them. It wasn't that the political effect was instant, but it did. It was like a kind of slow burning, slow release thing that changed a lot of people. And um, what did the play do that newspapers... Uh, it's a creative thing. It's the invention but it's, of... It's what you were talking yeah. about, the, yeah. the actual yeah. transformative nature of the event. Yeah, it? and, it's really and, the, yeah. and the, the idea of imagining a whole new world. But there is something else, I think. Yeah. It's so interesting you should have chosen those three plays, because what also they, they, they underlined uh, and made plain was the fact of, 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 of Scotland saying that effectively as a colony. And, and, and it seems to me that the, from this moment there comes a sense in which if you feel you're colonized, you, and you don't need the whole apparatus of, 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 of post-colonial theory, uh, there is something liberating about the act of recognition that, that your language has been stolen and your identity has been stolen that you are indeed, as, as in the famous French fan office, you know, you are uh, black faces wearing white masks. And at that moment, it seems to be the possibility of, of, of wanting to reinvent, to change, um, becomes an urgent necessity in a way it doesn't, you know, if you, if you, if you are the colonizer, doesn't it? <laughs> no, I don't actually, I, I, I think, I, I know what you mean, but I think the moment that I'm describing was the moment when people stopped thinking that. And they started thinking, well, to hell with that, you know, it's about future now. And, and, and I think those writers kind of capture that moment. Okay, I've got a few questions I want to ask about the difficulties and the tensions, but I think I should probably go out to the audience first, and then we can come back. There's a gentleman there. Yes. Well, uh, if I may say, compared to European, so mm -hmm. words that may not be opposite, uh, uh, you know, uh, that's something I fail to understand in what you're all saying. Why should be the uh, criterion of political theatre, why should it change be that? The greatest examples, some of the greatest examples of political theatre are not uh, provoking and preparing change, but mourning mm -hmm. and celebrating and fixing in the memory something that seemed to those people to have critical importance. You know, if you take the greatest disciple of Brecht, who is, in my opinion, is Heinrich Müller, who wrote some of the greatest pieces of political theater ever written. And, uh, well, those, Germania, all those pieces, are really not proposing change, not expecting change, but more, it's tragedy. It's, you know, in the origin of this Killian term, uh, the Killian sense of the term, uh, putting it at the, at the most radically and uh, uh, clearly and heroically in an ugly manner there on the stage and fixing in the memory of the community he's addressing, the imaginary community of German revolutionaries that may not exist any longer, uh, and say, more, cry, break down, be desperate. Well, that's also a message of political theatre. And whether that is changing in the past or not, well, you as theatrical people uh, are more qualified to decide that. I'm just the son of a theatre maker, uh, not myself. Somebody in the theatre. And there's a lady over here. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I, I wonder uh, what the panel has, has to say, because there is something missing today. Um, I don't know from uh, the um, uh, play writers uh, or from uh, the public because if you um, if we um, if I go back uh, to uh, for example Brecht and uh, the legacy in the land of Brecht was enormous in uh, 1955 a few months before he died he uh, went to open and and a venue that was uh, the, the Grassi Theatre that was established by <coughs> the Taylor and, and Grassi uh, following the, um, you know, Brecht, uh, um, uh, okay, teachings, predicament, or, or way of, of doing theatre. Or if we take Verdi and La Traviata, when it was uh, um, performed the first time, it was absolutely a fiasco because the middle class couldn't accept the fact that the prostitute was uh, rehabilitated 
as you know, a person, a woman with uh, uh, virtues and high aspirations. Or if we take uh, uh, Pirandello, six characters, that as well it was absolutely, you know, ooh, it's, it's now as well, it's, 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 it's very difficult, it's a very difficult play to accept, mm -hmm. incest uh, and suicide. So, uh, you know, in the past there was some, some really great conflict that we can, we can see now, we cannot see these, uh, these uh, um, um, battles uh, and, and I wonder if you have an idea why. Oh, yes, uh, you know. Can I say one? I, I think, I we'll think, have two minutes up here and then I've got you two. I think what Patrick said was, was, was very revealing in a way, if you think about what she said. If you think about, about Shakespearean theatre, I and mean, this is the theatre that we know the audience heard, and we, we reckon that the speed, at least mm -hmm. our best guess, the speed at which these plays were performed utterly, would be utterly incomprehensible. And what you might, have, you might want to argue, which is about what you were moving to work is that we've moved away from the language to spectrum. Uh, in a sense, it's been a kind of long journey in terms of what we want out of, of the theatrical in its, in, in its widest sense. And, and, and we've now reached perhaps an age where the spectacle is all. And, 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 and we have found a way, if you like, of, 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 of contemplating what a, a radical perspective, a radical perspective of spectacle theatre would be like. And I'm dotting what you were saying. Well, uh, uh, the, um, uh, my feeling about that is why is it is essentially, I don't know if, 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 if I'd be, it would be wrong to, to suggest that what you're asking is why is it the more political theatre? I mean, one of the problems that, because, what, yeah, because one of the problems I have is actually is, is the designation of political theatre in itself, you know, actually, that it is a genre, that actually, you know, that this is, this is where we are political. But actually, what I'm saying is that actually all, all theatre, all culture is political and it needs to be recognised as being fully politicised. And let's face it, there is plenty to be outraged and political about, you know, some, some of the things that we've touched upon, you know, that, uh, 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 in there. And I think that probably what will happen is that the genre of political theatre is probably going to have a bit of an upswing in the next, uh, you know, in the course of the next decade, you know, watch, watch, watch this space. But I think that even if that happens, and even if we kind of think this is a, this is a, this is a good thing, I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that all theatre is political and it should be politicised, you know. And I think that much of it, much of it, has to be the, I think the lot of theatre and a lot of culture has, has, a, has a very sort of, um, uh, you know, is, is an opiate, you know, essentially. But in the last decade or so, theatre managers have been instructed to politicise their theatre, not necessarily in its content, but in terms of the role it plays. So outreach programs, education programs, and all the rest of it. Um, aren't we seeing therefore too much politicisation of the Well, yeah. John, John's the person now. I mean, that is a political Yeah, thing. I mean, John, John's politicisation is, is widespread in the theatre now because there are so many funding streets which say things like, oh, where to put about mental health and even have money. Um, uh, but I mean, the fact is, patronage has always been a bit like that. It will draw a pretty picture of your aristocratic patron and you can have money. Uh, and, and sometimes artists manage to turn those situations into great art. Um, so I don't think we should get too precious about all of that. But there is a lot of junk stuff which has, has very kind of, you know, generally agreed sort of social purposes and is just no use. And, and you know, in, in, the, in the field of expression of every year, I see tons of that. And a lot of it is instantly forgettable. It's very well intentioned, but there is no artistic hair to it at all. I'm just and that's what you were talking about. <laughs> you were just asked that particular question. So, yeah. And what he's talking about is the fact that you have to justify your funding in terms of outputs, which most people who work in the subsidised sector regard as being, or having been, because it's slightly reducing actually now, as a tremendous waste of time, a huge waste of energy, but not in the end um, that damaging in terms of what you can actually put on. It's just a whole other bureaucratic rubbish. And I am much more concerned uh, by the, what, by, Think about what the political impact of the way the funding system is now evolving will be. Um, when we are more and more, and I'm running a regional theatre, and I see it absolutely every day, we're being encouraged to um, raise more and more money from businesses and from wealthy donors and um, the whole philanthropic agenda uh, which we're being encouraged to adopt. And the kinds of deal you have to make with your uh, paymasters 
although often not explicit, will have an impact on our freedom to make the kind of work that we want to work. And that, I, I think that's going to be something that we'll only discover looking back on this period. But just before we move on, I just want to applaud the point that was made about moments of mourning and moments of celebration as, as being genuinely political moments that we haven't talked about. I think the reason for that is that generally we are all impatient for something transformative. We sense that, we, that, that it would be great if there were a way to articulate the possibility of changing our world, and that applies to people who make theatre as well as everyone else. So I think that's what we're preoccupied with, but your point is absolutely right. Okay, there's a gentleman here. Um, I was interested that uh, Christopher Cook uh, commenting on the passenger, which was an absolutely stunning production by ENO, said that the unusual shift there was that it was seen from the Soviet perspective. Uh, I thought the unusual shift was it was seen through the eyes of a concentration camp guard. Uh, with the extraordinary comment at one stage uh, when the female concentration camp guard says of the Jewish inmates, why don't they like us? And that <laughs> struck me as an extraordinarily dramatic uh, shift of the approach to the Holocaust. The other thing uh, I thought two wives was equally an absolutely stunning in the introduction. If you're looking at opera, not so much in terms of politics, but holding a mirror up to society. Having an opera that was about uh, texting, uh, was about sexual deviation, was about manipulation, uh, that, it seemed to me, was absolutely stunning in its own way. While I'm about it, uh, I do wish you had a word of your Australian friend who produced Castor and Pollux, who succeeded in injecting a totally gratuitous, gratuitous piece of shock into it. Um, and I only hope that um, we can rely on Tom not to introduce a gratuitous shock into Clean Hopper. But could I just pick up the last point? Um, the McMaster Report on Excellence in the Arts, um, which has, thank God, been continued to develop, I thought raised the bar to an extraordinary extent by saying that great art was a completely transformative experience. And this led to the most ludicrous boxing exercise where the Department of Culture asked museums when looking at visitor reaction, the question, was visiting this museum a transformative experience? And I think my director say, you know, that we're not going to get there. I think to insist that theatre or opera is a transformative experience, I mean, most of us have five or six transformative experiences in our life. What you should be saying is, is it an enjoyable experience? And that's very good. Yeah, the lady there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, I quite agree with that last point, which is the point that we made, because uh, the, the panel that we talked about, how theatre, whether we can be transformed by the theatre, and, and whether that's a good thing or, or, or whether it can happen. And actually what concerns me more about political, what I say as political theatre, is the way that theatre is subordinated to politics. So instead of dramatising a political situation uh, using you know, the art, you, you get you know, trying to give a political message. And you know, having just come from uh, South Africa where uh, you know, you've got like the Marcus Theatre in Johannesburg, they have this policy of trying to bring on black producers, you know, that they have to have a certain quota now according to the government. And you get some atrocious plays being put on, just you know, they, they have this sort of um, very simple but you know, but supposedly radical political sort of message, you know, right on and cool, but the actual theatre is I mean, it's really horrible and excruciating to watch. So that's that's something that I think is more of a crime, and, and that we shouldn't be looking to theatre to transform society. Um, but that does mean theatre can't dramatise um, a social situation which makes one think a little better. And I mean, you mentioned David Hare before, and I remember seeing him doing Jerusalem, which I thought was a much better uh, dramatisation of the political situation in the Middle East, which was personal and much more powerful than a lot of these recent plays like Enron and Fashion, all these things, which seem much more about giving a political message, which was, I found the message 
not that exciting, and the theatre not not at all entertaining. So, maybe here. Um, I mean, Sam had thinking about how we use the term politics, mm -hmm. and I kept thinking about this, you know, writing down the whole room today, which is about this idea of actually about advocacy. And I think that actually we have a very strange concept of politics these days because we have career politics politicians. Mm -hmm. We have a very different reason why people learn to from that career and in their in their own positions. And whereas I think previously you have to find advocacy, which is you stand up to the mark, you ask questions about things which you feel like things are going to be or things that need to be understood. So um, you ask uh, uh, the advocacy came about actually standing up to the mark and asking questions about things or uh, questions where you felt questions need to be asked or trying to understand the answers and find answers to better solutions to things we thought we needed. And I think often that's actually what theatre often tries to do. But what it offers is a safe space in which uh, a person can go in a collective environment where they're safe to laugh about whatever it is, but just to receive and reflect on their own life in a slightly different way. Which often is what we do in lots of different cultural experiences. We often have the opportunity to, in a safe environment, reflect on yourself without anybody noticing it. And that can be done through joy and laughter mm -hmm. and through challenging, but it's just not just to do that. And I think that actually what you were saying about the politics of theatres and regional theatres and the way that they have to change everything, I don't think it's that. I think it's actually that they've asked to be advocates for their environment and understand the literal necessity of either the ergonomics of their space, their building, or the environment they're in, or the landscape they're in, or the demographic they're part of. And that they have to sign up and understand the space that they're part of. And I was thinking, you were saying about the funding change in funding that's coming out of this. I wonder how soon there is going to be a collective of art creators, whatever the art form, who take on the HBO model, which is that where TV was supposed to take on a much more commercial um, or take on the funding streams for the accepted backing from individuals, they started to find the content of their programmes was being influenced because the was going, but you can't say that, and they find the majority of this program. And HBO repeatedly came out of that because it was a group going, actually, no, no, we should be able to make work without the, the content being limited by our own funds. And I'm wondering how long before that there is a, a collective thought that comes up that through the creative process. Okay, I want to make sure I get everybody in the audience. Does anybody in the panel have one line that burning to say? So if you run away, you're happy. Good. Okay, there's a lady there and a gentleman there and a lady there. Yes. Um, yeah. I suppose, I mean, I, I'm quite interested in the idea of what is political theatre and like what Patrick was saying about well, in the way political theatre can be very broadly defined and that using the expression of mirror on the world, you know, the world tends to be a political place so when you look at it through theatre, theater, through drama, you, get, you can get in, insight into the way the world operates and, and those can be very interesting. But the way I've understood, always understood political theatre is in terms of radical theatre and it's often in the context of taking sides. So you, political theatre is about pushing a particular side, a particular point of view, and um, expecting the audience to take sides on that. And on the whole, if you're part of the audience in political theatre, you're already kind of on that side of the political theatre. You, you won't enjoy it as an experience if it's telling you something that you completely disagree with, um, unless you're a particularly friction-loving person. <laughs> um, so I think that, that to me, that's what political theatre is. And I think in that context, political theatre can be fantastic. Um, but I haven't seen any good political theatre for a good, good, good many years. And it's interesting that um, you, know, you were saying that you know, your examples all came from about 20 years ago. Um, and, and I think that, well, can you have, really, political theatre in the sense of, of um, radical theatre when there's such a political vacuum today, as there is today, where really it's, it's so hard to know what side you're going to take, unless it's a very, very simplistic sort of crude, you know, I'm for the poor, or I'm for, you know, I'm against, uh, I'm against environmental destruction, or, I mean, it's so simplistic, so uncomplicated, um, and so sort of, um, um, I'm just trying to say directionless or, or so, so without a kind of a, 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 so, so without a possibility of transformation actually 
that you could, you know, the, often the kind of political theatre that goes on today is about things that really we can do so little about in the current circumstances. So it becomes very difficult to take sides in that context, and therefore political theatre becomes, at least to my mind, quite pointless. Very patient, gentleman. Yeah, I just wanted to make the point. Um, you know, that forming politics is all the world a stage. The stage is a platform, and the newest platforms out, of course, um, people have started to take advantage of. Uh, I mean, I'd say I'd cite television, and in particular, it's still a you know in this context relatively new. But being able to share television programmes and dramas is very, very new. Uh, you know, just at the click of a button to be able to say, this is amazing, watch this. So that really becomes very political, because when you look at, for example, outfits like 38 Degrees that do all sorts, you can, you can join 200,000 other people and stop something happening at the click of a button. It's quite amazing. And I think it goes back to what um, a, a previous commentators have said about uh, context. It's about context. I remember... Um, for me, one of the most moving pieces of drama I saw on television, recent, well, I say recently, it was probably about 15, 20 years ago, it was an episode of EastEnders between Ethel and Dot, and the tension was which one of them was going to die. Neither of them died. I just thought one of them was going to die, and that was the tension. It was just a conversation they had. And it, and it cast my mind back to things like Play for Today on television, where we were still calling television dramas plays, the nine o'clock play, play for today, uh, things like Kez, things like Kathy Come Home, you know, that kind of really impactful, um, shocking drama, and other things like, you know, like Tom was talking about, the death of Klinghoff is coming up at e &O next year, you know, that, that is an immensely powerful piece of theatre, A Dog's Heart was an immensely powerful piece, piece of theatre. Um, and for me, it's always, I was a teacher for a long time, it was always about context. If you've got something to say, it doesn't matter what language you're using, you just create the right context. And if you can create the right context or the right platform, it's much easier to get your meaning across. And when you go back to, you know, I was always struck by the thought of Widower's Houses, the Shaw play, and Mrs. Warren's Profession. That would make a perfect television drama. It would sit so well as a plot line in EastEnders. You know, what would Shaw be doing today, you know? And just to kind of finalise that, so many theatres now and opera houses, etc., are looking at how they put their wares into the digital space. I think that's really exciting. And I'm just, I'm just hoping that people can still be really radical and do stuff really simplistically and come down to the language of what they're using to communicate rather than just numbing us with endless camera angles and shots and things, you know. Let, let's just have a two-header right there on your computer in your living room or, you know, an opera for one person singing. I think all of that, that potential now is immensely exciting. So, sorry. Okay, there's I'll a lady there and then I'll <coughs> ask the panel for their final remarks. Actually, it's useful because my questions are to follow that. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to with companies now that are wanting to distribute their stuff, you know, the, 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 the first performance is on the stage, but then it's relayed around the world on film, etc. And I understand that designers and directors are now being asked in their contracts to sign over all rights, so whereas previously you would come back on revivals, etc. Um, and I'm just wondering what the panel thinks the impact of that will be um, if the um, you know, original designers and directors and that vision is down the line going to be taken over by other people who are mediating that work. Okay, I'm going to ask the panel for their summations in the order that they spoke. You can obviously answer anything, but we're really looking at the future of political theatre. And I'm particularly partial to the question of the future of political theatre in a depoliticised age, but ignore me if you, if you want to. Chris? Well, I think, I think the thing that's emerged very strongly from what we're is the very active theatre in the world is a political act. And so there's a given, you know, we are talking about political theatre, but we're talking about theatre. The question, I think, becomes whether we think that the theatre ought to be about advocacy, making a particular case for a particular community at a particular time, which is clearly one role, or whether we think, which is what I was arguing at the very beginning, that great, great pieces are about 
possibility of embracing conflict, exploring uh, you know, the clash of character, and above all, creating a complete work, either by language or spectacle, within which you locate a series of arguments and debates within the categories. And that seems to me to be possibly the bravest and most risky business of all. And we talked about La Traviata, and you're right to remind us the first production of Venice was a very dangerous and risky business. And, you know, Traviata has now become everybody's favorite warm bath of you slip in and feel happy about yourself at the end. That's what you've done beautifully. How do you create a complete world uh, where, in the end, that sense of outrage that, that moved the first audience of it still exists in this world? And how do you, you work, create these complete worlds with these conflicts in it? There's no easy answer, but in the end, it comes surely to an effort of the world, like so many things. Perfect. Um, uh, just to, I suppose where, where, where I'm, uh, after this discussion, where I'm sort of uh, pitched up, and, and certainly in terms of uh, also feel, uh, thinking about what has been uh, uh, mentioned by people on the, uh, on the floor as well, is that um, uh, there is simply, uh, people seem to be asking, at least some of you anyway, uh, uh, where, um, uh, where has political theatre gone? And it seems to me that, as I think Joyce was also implying, that it's um, the, the, the times throw up political theatre. So I don't think that political theatre creates the times. And I think that, that, that theatre offers a forum for uh, uh, you know, discussion of politics and ideas and, and emotions and uh, experience and representation um, in, in these ways. Um, and I think that the reason that I say that, moreover, that I think that we probably will get more overtly political theatre uh, uh, emerging in a way that I think that the theatre may become more overtly politicised is because I think that the times we are in are, to use the ghastly phrase, are clearly not sustainable. You know? And I just don't think, I don't know, it's not apparent to me how we can march on with billions and billions of, of, of pounds of debt, you know, and I think that you know, in Greece to see uh, how, you know, how it goes. So I think, I think you know, Stand by, we're going to get very politicised. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite amusing also to imagine that we, we as a society can uh, uh, point our finger at theatre and say, come on, be more political, can you help get us out of this <laughs> 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 but, but I'm, I'm still very struck by the, by the, by the mourning and celebrating man. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and, uh, and also, in order for I mean, in order for some theatre artists to feel sufficiently motivated uh, to want to be transformative, uh, it's not because we want them to, it's because they are restless people, or, or we are restless people who are doing it, who just simply will not give up on the impossible project of trying to change things. Mm -hmm. um, but something happened, I think, uh, that some of that kind of work is dependent on a sort of um, residual understanding that if we as a society unite, and make our voices heard, change will follow. Um, and I think that we've still got to mourn the uh, anti-war march properly, because I think that, that, that it was a huge event for us as, as a society, because being on that march, who here was on that march? Oh. Yeah, right. yeah, 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 the yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Never mind. Yeah. Got for us was on that march. Yeah. Um, we, we were there before, well, this is it, look, look at all these men. There's literally so many people here, we've got to be, this This must be it. This must be the moment where our collective voice is going to make a difference. No, not a bit, not a whisper. And, then, and I think there's a loss of faith, actually, in what we can achieve by uniting our voices, which we have to recover from, and we, I hope we do recover from. Yeah, well, I I mean, the more I work as a theatre critic, the more I realise that all theatre is political, without a doubt. When people go into that collective space, they receive messages which either affirm or undermine or do something to them. Um, and, and I still think, as I said at the beginning, that, that John McGrath speak about that as one of the best ever written, in the sense that he, he talks about all the parameters of a theatre event, the whole context, and how that shapes people's perception of whether it's for them, whether it's not for them, whether they're going to enjoy it, all the rest of it. So the whole thing is drenched in politics. I was really taken with this question um, about the HBO model, by the way, because I think that's beginning to emerge. Isn't there something on the internet now called We Did This? Which is a kind of, you found it. Yeah, where, where people kind of collect 
particularly fun bit, yeah, so that, I think that is beginning to happen, but that's a whole other subject. But, but the main thing I want to say in, in winding up is I don't think we should be too depressed about an apparent absence of political theatre um, on the past models of political theatre, or even an apparent absence of controversy on the model of past controversies, like a fantastic Rami at the first night of six characters in search of an opera when, when, when the playwright and his family had to flee the theatre down the street. Um, um, but um, um, I think the point about um, the point about a creative process is that each political situation and each set of political dilemmas throw up their own form of radical event. And at the moment, I, you know, it, that's what I was trying to say about the perspective. It's easy for me to see, looking back into the 1980s, what the radical events were then. But they maybe didn't look so radical at the time, or they maybe didn't look so successful at the time. Um, and I, I know that I'm seeing events now of a fantastic range of different forms and approaches to the audience. Lots of one-to-one -one theatre. What's that all about? Lots of lots of theatre using kind of you know elements from soap opera and video and so on, kind of woven in with a live event. Lots of live events streaming themselves onto the internet. You know, all of that's going on, and it's impossible to say when you're this close to which of those will turn out to have been the ones that were really sowing the seeds of a new radicalism. But I must say, I am very confident that some of them will be. And I think, you know, it's a privileged position being a theatre critic to be able to see so much creative work going on. But I think the great thing um, is, is this power of creativity itself to transform things. And what people are doing at best, yes, they can use theatre as a forum for discussing things, um, but, but, but when they are actually working at their full creative bent, what they're doing is imagining a different reality. Even if they're mourning or celebrating, they're imagining a world in which this grief would be properly honoured. Or they're imagining a world in which this kind of language could be spoken. Or they're imagining a world which would be this funny and this, this romantic and this beautiful. And that is transformative. And it's the act of imagination and not just the act of discussion that makes, makes the artistic process special, I think. Well, I think we should applaud that and long live the imagination. Thank you very much.